These guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. All right, as the YouTube audience can see, you're a huge Twins fan, Kyle, and uh, I am Phil, the host of the Score North Twin Show. And all we just we just wanted the Twins to win a playoff game at some point, and they checked that box. So, of all the exciting things that were happening this weekend in Minnesota sports, are you more excited for the Twins winning their third playoff game in a week, or the Wolves winning two preseason games in Abu Dhabi against the Dallas Mavericks? How do you weigh those two things? So it was a it was a anniversary this weekend of my birth. So I have basically been on like a forty eight hour birthday bender. I have worn this for like three days. So I started my <laughs> birthday by watching the Wolves sweep the Mavericks in Abu Dhabi. A little stumble with the Twins on Saturday, but then they righted the ship on Sunday. So as as good as the Twins have been, um, this is kind of a deep dive stat, but I don't think the Twins have lost a playoff series since Anthony Edwards switched jersey numbers. Yeah. So uh, well, 2000, went, 2020, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, so when Ant went from one to five yeah. about three months ago, I don't think the Twins have lost a playoff series since then. So you might be able to oh, take dude. that one and do what you want. But uh, I mean, it's the, the math adds up to me. I don't know. Yeah. The Wolves Friday, Saturday, I'm coming into this season, maybe a little spoiler alert, trying my hardest to like keep expectations relatively professional and tame. Not and after throw that Milton out the window. Performances. Not after because that. <laughs> Nikhil Alexander Walker might be the tenth best player in the league. Like he just like, <laughs> oh, I guess I'll just start for Ant on Friday and Jaden on Saturday, and I'll just be exquisite. The big man rotation of Nas, Carl, and Rudy was great. So I don't know where you want to start, but I came into Friday and Saturday being like preseason games. Let's not overreact. Yeah. And then Saturday afternoon between some mimosa and some bloody mare, I was like, actually, I think they could win sixty games. Yeah. I think. Uh, well. I'm glad you brought up a win total here because we will Ooh. do. Let's do three things on this episode. Okay. Let's do a listener sent us. We can do this toward the end. Listener Isaiah Potts. He listened to our top 100 Timberwolves of all time episodes. That's right. We did two of them in the off season. <laughs> and he said, and we joked at the end of my top 100 said we would, we would keep going, but we're out of time. If a listener wants to send in the next 100 from 101 to 200, you're welcome to. We'll totally read it on the show. Isaiah Potts has done just that. He has <laughs> he has the next 100 best Timberwolves from 101 all the way to 200, and we will read that list. So we'll do that. We've got ESPN win projections from Kevin oh, Pelton okay. from Analytics. But let's start with just going back and forth. Let's just overreact to the Timberwolves beating the Mavericks in their first two preseason games. I want to know, unless you throw one out, I'll throw one out. We can go back and forth on these. The best things you saw in the first two preseason games. You start the, us off. So a little context here. Again, if you missed him, uh, Anthony Edwards did not play on the Friday game because of a slight ankle thing, played on Saturday. Jaden did not play on Saturday, slight ankle thing. They're both totally okay. But the biggest, best takeaway from those first two games, without a doubt, is the play of Carl Anthony Towns. He looked 100% healthy. He looked 100% comfortable. I think it was the Friday game, the first possession maybe, Carl just let one rip like he was playing for the DR mm -hmm. from 30-some feet out. He's attacking the basket. His defense looks good. The big man, when him when he was out there with Rudy, they didn't look awkward. Um, so without getting into my second and third one, I just think overall the play of Carl Anthony Towns, he looks as healthy as ever, maybe as happy as ever, and that's important. I know we've talked about hierarchy and all this stuff, but in a league that just needs talent, like you just talent usually – helps you win games more than any other sport. He is the perfect, you know, second banana, if you want to call it for Ant. And he looks about as locked in and they're getting him in the right spots, pin down threes and stuff. So I thought he looked phenomenal in those first two games. Can I add to what you just said, which is talent wins games in the NBA. I think egoless talent wins mm, yeah. games in the mm -hmm. NBA. Cause it, we've seen examples where there's two or three guys, usually James Harden's involved and they all think that they're the alpha and then they like then they get mad at the coach or they get mad at each other or whatever and then ego kind of ruins the whole thing but then you see other examples like the Celtics from 15 years ago Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, Rajon Rondo or the Miami Heat with LeBron and Baj and Dwayne Wade. I by the way, I am not comparing yet Edwards, Cat yet. and Gobert or McDaniel's or whoever your big 3 is yet. I'm just saying we see examples where a bunch of talent on the same team and things get weird. 
But when a bunch of talent gets together, moves their egos aside, and just plays for each other and plays to win, I think that would be the hope with this team. Whether you want to use a pecking order of like Anthony Edwards, number one, cat number two, whatever, we can debate all that stuff. But Carl Anthony Towns looks a little bit more refreshed than maybe we've seen. I don't know if it was the FIBA World Cup stuff. Maybe maybe there's a refreshing feeling to just not having the weight of the entire franchise on your shoulders, seemingly, now that Anthony Edwards has kind of risen into that role, right? Maybe he just feels like, this is great. I mean, I'm just going to come out here, shoot threes. I'm empowered to shoot threes. It worked really well for me in the World Cup, and Anthony Edwards is over here as the Batman you know, I guess time will tell once we see some actual regular season games. But I, I, I agree. Like, his general dominance so far in the preseason has been great to see. And there's one play, because, again, I know if you're critical or you're a glass-half-empty person, you always want to be like, well, it's preseason. The Mavs didn't have so-and-so. They played a bunch of rookies. There was one play that stood out that is impenetrable and undebatable and is in the second game, I think, on Saturday when Carl went coast-to-coast diving for a loose ball in a meaningless preseason game. <laughs> a, a, a yeah. Truly, like a play that if Carl's on the ground, it's usually because he drove to the basket, fell down, and didn't get a call. Like that type of performance and effort, you want to talk about like leadership and all that other stuff. Like you got a guy who's making the most money on the team or whatever, and he's diving for loose balls in a preseason game. That was actually worth something to me because that showed a level of commitment. I mean, they took those two first preseason games so serious and business like that he really stood out as like the number one thing, but there was a lot of other good takeaways. So I'm curious to see what you got. Who to all of this, like wolves diving on the floor in preseason games. And some of the other players we'll talk about just playing their asses off again in preseason games, bet the wolves for the in-season tournament. Oh my God. I, yeah. I, I think yeah. so much of it's going to be who <laughs> cares the most in November and December. And there's going to be teams like, LeBron and the Lakers or the Warriors were like, that's not their goal isn't to peak in Vegas the second week in December, right? The Dallas or the uh, the Denver Nuggets at this point probably don't need to be peaking the second week in December. If you're the Timberwolves, you should be trying to win as many games as you can early the whole season. You should be trying to get to 55, 60 wins if you can, right? And put the league on notice. So I, I think... The fact that they're diving all over the place in the preseason tells me they're going to try like hell to come out of the gate hot, unlike last year. Bet the Wolves for the in-season tournament, kids. Well, would there be a more Minnesota Timberwolves moment than like winning the inaugural play-in, or not play-in, but the inaugural in-season tournament yeah. would, I mean, am I wrong? Would we be hang the biggest banner, accomplishment right? in franchise history? Is like, it, would, would that be a bigger accomplishment than getting to the Western Conference Finals and losing in six games? Uh, that, that's up for we debate. We put that on a pretty big pedestal, right? Like we got to the Western, we got to the third round of the playoffs one time and almost got to a game seven. Hang but the banner. I mean, <laughs> but this one, it's like we we won a tournament. It's, it's on ESPN. It's a, it, it's, it's on TV. Yeah. It's in the same weekend as Vikings Raiders, which I don't know if the Vikings will have a team by then, but uh, it would be a pretty substantial moment. So I'm with you that that, they, again, to bring it back to this Abu Dhabi doubleheader, they looked like a real professional basketball team. And I know that doesn't mean much in October, but it, I'm putting more and more stock into preseason performance because they looked like complete garbage last preseason, yeah. and it translated right into the start of the season. Yeah. Okay, best things that we saw, I'm going to give you sort of two guys in one bundle okay. here. Role players looking like perfect fits with big-time energy, understanding what their role is. Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Shake Milton. So uh, Nikhil with just energizer bunny up and down, make a play on defense, bring the ball all the way down, kick it out to the corner, like great court vision. Uh, even talking at Wolves Media Day a week or two ago about sort of embracing and loving being the glue guy and yep. being a guy that he's not coming in here to... to sometimes Jalen Noel, this is, my, like, this is a pointless drive-by of Jalen Noel here, but... <laughs> He came in and it was like he thought he was as good as Anthony Edwards at scoring. And some nights he was. Like he was a fantastic scorer at times. But Jalen Noel was a classic, doesn't fully understand his role here kind of a guy. We don't need you to jack to jack up 12 shots all the time. Okay. If you yep. could just like go grab a rebound and, you know, maybe get a ba a basket for somebody else. I think Nikhil Alexander Walker coming in here since, you know, whatever, two months to go in last season, understands and loves his role. 
And Shake Milton, I'm not one to necessarily overreact to a preseason plus minuses in small samples, but I'm going to right now. He was a plus 14 in 15 minutes in one of those preseason games. And now they're giving him a chance. Like When he started games and played big minutes for the Sixers, he played really, really well. Yep. When you when you give him sample as either a point guard or or an off guard, uh, he can do some damage. So again, two preseason games. Uh, this is a total homer overreaction. Love what I saw from Shake Milton and Nikhil Alexander Walker. So my second one, I was just going to look this up. In both games, so the, this big experiment, the Rudy Gobert trade, right? Like this team literally is one of the biggest teams in the league in terms of height and size yeah. and they throw out some crazy f- five-man lineups that had like shake milton at the point guard and he's you know low-key tall and long um but i think in the two games the w- wolves and mavs played as i'm just doing numbers on the fly i think the wolves outscored the mavs like a hundred and some to like 60 points in the paint Oof. and to me that just says that like you're a big team that is embracing being big and the mavs were playing rookies and small guys and they weren't taken very seriously but like this is your this is what you're building this is your theme like this is what makes up your team is yeah. we have a bunch of big guys in size lean into that Dude. dominate the boards dominate the paint and they did like last year they didn't play with a purpose as being a bunch of big guys this year it seemed like again in two desert basketball games that they were like embracing being big yes dude basketball for 100 years at its core is about being really tall yeah. <laughs> yeah, and getting close to the basket so yep. you can get an easy two points, right? Yep. Or or being really tall and preventing the other team from getting easy baskets and getting close to the hoop. And then, ten years ago, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson come along and completely throw off the entire matrix, right? It's like for years and years and years you had all these fun guards and fun like the, the three point shooting teams are cute. That's nice, but. That's a second round exit in the playoffs because at the end of the day, the game grinds down to a halt and you just need size to rebound, you know, to bang around in the paint and uh, block shots and get to the free throw line. And then like the Warriors came along and everyone said everything we've known about basketball, let's throw it out the window and start shooting 28 foot threes 40 times a game. Right. And I think lately we're kind of coming around again, Kyle. I mean, the Denver Nuggets, that's one of the bigger teams in the NBA. They're running out these big lineups just kind of leaning on teams, making them feel uncomfortable. And then you have to be able to shoot and be athletic enough to to cover space on defense, right? But the Wolves seem to have some of that. So how far can they push being big without necessarily getting small ball paper cutted to death? I think we ha- sometimes we have this fear like, oh, we saw Rudy Gobert a couple times in the playoffs with the Jazz get run off the court, you know? Well, some of that was the players that he was playing with, too. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, you know, we'll see if it works or not. But I kind of like that Chris Finch and Tim Connolly have said, you know what? Being big is not a bad thing in basketball, okay? Like, just having a bunch of dudes that are six foot six and taller up to seven feet doesn't have to be a bad thing. Let's find a way to make it work. Yeah, I mean, the Den- the Denver Nuggets is the pinnacle of that comp because they just won the title. But they had Michael Porter Jr. and Aaron Gordon and, and obviously Jokic. But then you start to look around like what the Celtics did, their big offseason move was, other than Drew Holiday, was to go get like Porzingis and add it to their front line. The the Cavaliers were like well reported that they were after Nas Reed if he would have become a free agent. They already have a Jared Allen, they already have an Evan Mobley. So if you're a casual, and don't say that in a bad way, but if you're a casual fan, you're probably still thinking like, oh, the NBA, it's a bunch of small ball. And teams some teams have that from what the roster is, but more and more teams are starting to add size again. Like you mm-hmm. don't really know you're in a trend until the trend has like moved forward and now you're into another yeah. trend. I, we're in a trend right now where size and, you know, dominating around the basket on both ends, rebounding, protecting the rim, and then, you know, easy baskets is kind of the trend right now. And you're seeing more teams lean into it. So, again, I'll say it one more time. It was two meaningless games against the Dallas Mavericks team that I think, by the way, is just is so overrated. They obviously didn't have Luke and Kyrie in both games, but. Uh, they just play a lot of bad players and a lot of young players. Whereas, like, if you go to the Wolves, I'm just going to steal my final or my other point is, like, the Butler Brigade is what I will call the Wolves' third stringers this season. They're really good. Like, the guys like Josh Minot, I thought Wendell Moore looked really good defensively. Leonard Miller catching Leonard, threes. Leonard Miller, he's not, like, kicking the, his feet out anymore. Like, they have a ton of really young talent that's never going to play 
but it adds to the idea that you and I have talked about all summer. Like this is way deeper of a team than they were last year. And last year's team was historically deep. And that's important. Maybe not in October, but in January when, you know, someone's out, Mike Conley's out for a week or you got to sit Rudy or something. So this team is just going to grind out, in my opinion, regular season wins mm-hmm. because again, in those cold nights in January where you're going from Toronto to Charlotte to Minnesota, like you'll just throw in guys that have real skill and you won't have a talent drop off. So I saw you, uh, you got into a Twitter back and forth with somebody that had, was <laughs> oh, adamantly boy. saying that the Gobert trade remains the worst trade in the history of professional sports. And yet, the Timberwolves are sitting here right now projected by ESPN to have the second best record in the Western Conference. They have a guy like Leonard Miller, who's this just like crazy four position, up and down athletic freak, six what is he, six foot nine, six foot mm-hmm. ten, that's never going to play, at least in the first part of the season. They've got young talent like Josh Minot just kind of sitting there, like you don't even know what to do with some of these guys. I'm not super worried about a late first round draft pick. I'm just not. Like, I don't... Well, and that... Ugh, I wish you wouldn't have brought that up. That tweet was sent on Saturday, Saturday, and I was uh, <laughs> six mo- mimosas deep in four calmer rolls. But uh, the, the the context I didn't like was that regard- the tweet was, regardless of what happens this season... Opportunity uh, cost is what he said. It's a bad trade. And that would be like saying, like, I love playing the 50-50 raffle at events. And sometimes my family or, you know, my significant other has been like, well, that's a waste of money. And regardless of what happens, that's a waste of money. It's like, well, it's not a waste of money. If I win the 50-50 raffle, I got 40000 extra dollars. Like, how is that a waste of money? <laughs> now, if I lose it, you know, whatever. So It's bad process, though. Is, I think uh, yeah, sure. So I, I think this team, and to the Rudy Gobert tr- stuff, I, you and I have kind of made a private pact that we got to just stop talking about what it costs to get him. Because if you're going to continue to focus on what it costs to get him, and you're going to think Tim Conley, and you're going to word associate Rudy Gobert trade. You said it earlier. We then need to start to add the D'Angelo Russell trade into that whole mix. Mm-hmm. Because not only did you get Mike Conley, who is your starting point guard now, and maybe for years to come, you really dug out a hidden gem in Nikhil Alexander-Walker. But also, you got those extra second-round picks that you then used one of them to move up to get Leonard Miller. So you mm-hmm. traded D'Lo for Mike Conley, Nah. And Leonard Miller, and you still have a couple extra second round picks. So. Also, dude, Rudy Gobert was in my uh, my final thing on my list. The best things I saw over the weekend in the preseason was Rudy Gobert's push shot from about nine <laughs> feet in the lane. Yeah, we talk about the three pointer that he shot uh, that went viral in the World Cup. He now has a push shot that looked pretty good. Test driving at Abu Dhabi, but. Rudy Gobert, if you believe in some of the advanced metrics, was the most impactful player on that team last year. I know it sounds crazy, but his even though he wasn't the same player that he had been maybe at his peak in Utah, he was the the, the Timberwolves leader in win shares per 48, and I believe in player efficiency rating mm-hmm. because he's still good. Like That's the thing. Some of the other pieces maybe didn't fit perfectly around him, but you got to the playoffs— you fought Denver hard, harder than almost anyone else did throughout the entire, maybe maybe the biggest fight of anyone in the playoffs, right? In large part because Rudy Gobert made life difficult, more difficult than most people for the Nuggets, you know, yep. most valuable player, future Hall of Famer, Jokic. So, I don't know, I'm kind of like, I'm with you, like, okay, was it an overpay maybe? I don't, like, maybe. That's also a year and a half ago now. Like, the, right. the roster is evolving. You're not desperate for first-round picks. If you need a first round pick at some point just to get you know freedom to trade, you can easily trade any number of players on this team for first round picks. There's a Carl Anthony Towns trade that could be made at some point. You're not locked up here and you have a really good team that's projected to make some noise in the Western Conference. So, you know. And and I thought the so your point about Rudy in those first couple of games and the push shot, he also had a I think I tweeted out this play where he like backed a guy down with what looked like a real post move. I would hope that yeah, that's the last a time. Dunk. Yeah. yeah, I hope that's the last time he does that this season. But uh the way he got his touches and his looks were far more organic and natural in the flow of things. Tyler, yeah. there's a he writes or Canis Hoopas. Tyler Metcalf did like a nine minute video breakdown, but it showed certain sets and it's like when you really peel back a play and you see all the different actions that go into it, they got Rudy the ball much better than I mean last preseason when they were in a, in Vegas against the Lakers like they would literally just throw him the ball like you do in a rec league with an old guy and just be like all right get to work Rudy and it's like he has no <laughs> post moves so yeah he's not I, Elijah on here okay I thought go. I thought Chris Finch I mean honestly other than Carl's performance the biggest thing I took away was that they 
implemented a lot more structure. And that was kind of the, the media day chicken and egg was structure versus flow. I think mm-hmm. they're going to have a lot more structure in moments to get guys the ball in right spots and then build off of there with flow and kind of freestyle and, and things like that. I like it, man. Just like oh, this show. Real basketball talk. Ooh, you know, I had yeah, to snap out of it. Let's get back to jokes. with the, the football sounder. Football. <laughs> oh, it out. Um, so, yeah, so we saw some things to overreact to in the Wolves' first two preseason games. Uh, they come back. I think they play again in, it's like the On 14th, Saturday, 16th. Yep. Okay, Saturday. Yep. And then the season is, what, three weeks away, less than three weeks away from the start of the regular season, in which you're going to start joining us twice a week on Flagrant Howls. Bet. So gear up for some more Kyle Tagge in the house here. Um, in terms of how the national media, or at least the analytical corner of the national media, views the Timberwolves' chances in the West this year, my friend, ESPN's Western Conference projections. I believe this is from Kevin Pelton, who used to run uh, basketball prospectus back in the day. So he's got, I'll start at the bottom here. He's got, these are the top 10 teams. He's got the Clippers at 40 and a half, Mavericks at 41 and a half. He's got the Lakers at 41 and a half, and the Kings at 43. And those are your play in teams. Then at the sixth spot, he's got the Pelicans at 43.2. The Suns at 43 and a half, which feels a little low, but they can't stay healthy. Uh, the Warriors at 43.7, which again, they're trying to make Chris Paul work. They're getting yep. older, like it's a whole deal. Uh, so, but the Warriors are the four seed at 43.7. Nuggets as the three seed with 46 and a half. And then the Timberwolves as the two seed, just a tick under 48 wins behind the Grizzlies at 48 and a half. How do you feel about two things? 47.7 wins over or under and the number two team in the Western Conference. Well, to actually give you one additional answer, how do you feel about the number one projected team in the West having 48 wins? Because that was one of my big takeaways was like, we, you say it all the time, like, oh, the West is so deep. The league is so deep. The West could be such a bloodbath this year. Yeah, that it goes. It leans back into my original thought about like, I, that might be why the Timberwolves and Finch and his staff are like, let's take these preseason games halfway around the world serious because this the the NBA season is a marathon, but a lot of teams do start out at a slow pace. I think Finch wants those guys on October twenty fifth against Toronto to be running like sub five miles yeah. because you can't you cannot have what happened last year and blow a bunch of games to bad teams. Because it's these project again projected numbers, but what's the difference between the first place projected Grizzlies and the tenth place projected whatever? It's like six and a half, seven it's, games. That's uh, two weeks. One through ten is eight win difference, which is crazy. Yeah, I will say a couple things about this because th- this applies with baseball projections too, and even you'll look at like some of the NFL projections. Very rarely do these analytical systems. Yep. Project yep. like 60 wins for like in the NFL, you there's going to be a 13 win team, but the preseason projections would consider that to be an outlier for whatever mm-hmm. reason. So I think what's happening here, too, is there's going to be a team that wins at least 50 games in the Western Conference. You can't convince me that there won't be. But what this is saying is there's 10 formidable teams on paper here, but then there's also teams that aren't listed, Kyle. So let's go. I'm just trying to see the Jazz aren't listed. They're feisty. The yep. Jazz are going. The, the Jazz are. The Jazz aren't going to win twelve games, right? Like they're right. going to be a feisty competitive team. Um, the San Antonio Spurs have interesting talent and one of the best young players in the world, who's going to be trying to figure it out mm-hmm. in his first year in the NBA. And who else didn't make this list here? I mean, the dude, the Mavericks aren't on this list, and they've got no, the maybe Blazers. The Blazers. Yep. Or oh, the Mavericks are on here. Yep. The, but the but the Blazers. I know they traded Dame, but like. They've got interesting young talent. They're, that's not like a rollover 14-win team, mm-hmm. right? So even the teams that aren't going to make the playoffs in the West are going to be, your, hey, it's the second end of a back-to-back on the road, and you're going to play the Blazers tonight. That's yep. not a gimme game by any means, right? Well, I wanted to set that stage because the original question is, what do you think about the Wolves being projected to finish second in the West? And as much as I am a homer, like, is it really that outlandish? Because every team and every fan base can do the what-if game, but I was looking up the last year's standings, right? So the Nuggets and the Pelicans, so the first-place team and the 10th-place team, had an 11-game 
differential, right? The Nuggets won 11 more games than them. So the Wolves finished eighth, and they were 42 and 40. But they were three games out of what would have been the four seed. So for this, again, like what Pelton is telling us is that it might look a little different in the standings, and one would think it's not just going to be the Lakers first through eighth, and that it's going to be so tight that if the Wolves can just clean up those Detroit Pistons on New Year's Eve and those Houston Rockets in January and win those games, games that you were up by 20, yeah, there's really no reason that this team can't get to, I mean, the Kings were 48 and 34. That's what Pelton is saying they can do. And that would mm-hmm. have been a five-game difference for the Wolves last year, and they blew 18 double-digit leads. So The Thunder is another team that had that, oh, that's okay, not, good call. the 10-year. The, the, the Thunder were the nine seed you know, of a 40 and 42 team last year. So, yeah, man, this is, and you're right. When you go back and look, it's not as easy as saying the Wolves lost, whatever it was, you know, uh, 10 games to bad teams. I don't remember what the cutoff was there. You can't just flip it and say, if you give them those 10 wins, you're Mm -hmm. not, you're going to, you're going to have some nights where the Pistons beat you. It's life in the NBA. But is it fair to say the Wolves left, like, realistically, like you said, four to five wins, let's call it five of those games that should have been flipped if you just were more mature and if Anthony Edwards was 25 years old instead of like um, that gets you to 47, which would put you two games ahead of the Suns for the four seed, like you were saying. So, and, and we're all talking about this, you and me and Dane and everyone else, like and the fans. But what I picked up from media day and Kyle Anderson talked about it. The team is talking about this. They're talking about the lack of maturity they had, whether it be with internal fighting or just not taking games seriously. And Kyle Anderson talked about how they lost so many games against bad teams. So am I, am I trying to connect too many dots? Maybe. Let's see how they come out on, on Saturday against the Knicks in New York. But they were way more talented than the Mavs in Abu Dhabi on Friday, on Thursday and Saturday or whatever. And they played with a purpose, whether it be their style being big or their structure on offense. So I think this is a theme for them now that's like, okay, we look around the locker room and we are really good. Um, we know we have the t- Timberwolves stink on us, but let's try to, d- you know, like the Twins are doing right now. Like, none, no one in that locker room cares the history of the franchise. No one. Mm-hmm. Because they're, most of them are too young to give a damn. Like, let's just try to change the perception on this, and it starts by playing real serious basketball in October, and hopefully that'll leak into November, December, and January. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you've you've been, you got the Twins jersey on here. I, I'm glad that you brought <laughs> I had up. a shower, man. Ooh. The Twins, it's just like it's six days of birthday <laughs> celebration. No showering. Um, one thing I love about the Twins this year, as they crept closer and closer to, okay, win the division, and then we got the playoffs on the horizon here. There's been a lot of Twins teams in the past that tried to distance themselves from the stink of 0-14, 0-15, then 0-18, front office all the way down to players you know reporters would ask him questions five six years ago right hey what do you think it's been uh you know 15 years now it's been 16 years since you last won a playoff game or a playoff series and most of the players or front office people or manager or whatever would just be that's not us listen that goes back to the early 2000s you know they would sort of lead their answer with we have really nothing to do with this this year's team was different, man. Like Kyle Farmer in his champagne-soaked division championship shirt and hat gets on the Bally Sports North microphone and says, we are very much aware of the 0-18, and it ends this year. And Ryan Jeffers, same thing, right? Dude, Pablo Lopez shows up for game one of that wild card series wearing a Johan Santana jersey. Johan was the last pitcher before this year to win a playoff game for the Twins. There's something about... When you when you dismiss, hey, I mean, what if I was born in the early two thousands? You know, I wasn't around in two thousand four. That's true, but the fans were around in two thousand four. Yep. The fans were around in two thousand six and nine and ten. So when when teams dismiss the failure uh, the failure of the franchise, it's kind of like dismissing the fans in a way. It's sort of disrespectful. So now there's been some Timberwolves players like Carl Anthony Towns who's been around for you know, about a third of the misery going back to 2004, the last time the Wolves won a playoff series. But I would urge the Timberwolves to not fall into that trap. Chris Finch, front office, hey, man, just because you weren't around in 2009, 2011, you know, when this team was garbage, the fans were around. So um, I don't think it's as big of a, there's not like a streak that the, like the Twins had a streak. There is no like, I guess the streak would be they haven't won a playoff series since 2004, but no one really talks about that streak. But own the stink, I guess, is the moral of the story here. No, wait, no, I love that. 
Can we just talk about that a little more? Own the stink. Yeah, that, that, that's better than 50 is nifty. I don't think I was saying the opposite of that. No. I was just thinking Royce Lewis comes to mind as we're just going to talk more twins here. Is like being cognizant of the dumpster fire that is your employer while also being like, like I remember once I literally did that. I asked Ant at some point last season in a locker room setting. I was like, do you know, do you know who David Kahn is? No idea. Right. He doesn't, he's not aware about the Joe Smith stuff. Like that yeah. stuff is Timberwolves lore. And I'm with you. Like, I think you should acknowledge it, you know, like where, <laughs> where a Johnny Flynn Jersey to a playoff game, right? Like make some jokes, but also these guys are so young. It's like th- that. We didn't mess that up. Like we're here. We're fresh. We're ready to, to, to end that streak, to end the stigma. And I do think the younger guys, especially Ant, I think Nas Reed is another one too. That's like, we're not concerned with what happened in the past or how it happened, but we're cognizant of what happened. Mm-hmm. And we are going to do everything we can to make sure that that is no longer. I mean, if you're a Twins fan and I am like, I think the next 10 years of your life are just going to be different because they've won a playoff series. Now, yeah. it'll be great if they won, you know, a World, World Series and multiple playoff series, but you can talk to it more than I can. But over the weekend, talking to my friends, like the perception in Minnesota right now of just a sports city is different than it was a week ago. And the Wolves can play a really big part in that as well as the Twins. We are the 40-year-old virgin, man. And now, <laughs> and now it's like the end of that movie where they're, dan- they're dancing around and whatever. It's like that's Twins fans right now. Bags of sand. <laughs> so, yeah, I think – it. I mean, just to put a bow on this Twins conversation, there is a certain like – exhale and cathartic feeling they've now won three i don't think it's a coincidence once you get the first one all of that pressure goes away now this is great no expectations now at some point okay maybe they maybe they get to the next round they lose and then like there's going to be more expectations in the next year i mean you never just like get away without expectations in sports but it's a sweet spot when you can kind of free roll your way into a run like they're in right now and I think for the Timberwolves, even though the Gobert trade put some expectations on and Anthony Edwards has expectations, I don't think yet it's championship expectations. Mm-hmm. Right. Go play your ass off in the regular season and go go win a playoff series for the first time. Get that exhale sort of cathartic exp- you know, uh, feeling or experience. And, and then we'll see where the expectation meter lies in a year from now. And you are way more po- dialed into the Twins than I am. But I will say one thing that I really enjoy what the Twins have done, not just this past week and this week with the games they have, but also just this season, is they have really embraced their past. And that helps, right? Having, you know, the, the Joe Mowers come back and the, the Torrey Hunters and the, all these guys come back and be a part of it so mm-hmm. that the younger guys do know who Joe Smith is or do know some of the stuff. So that's another reason why you and I are at the forefront of this. But whenever the ownership thing does hopefully eventually get to the finish line, having Kevin Garnett back, having some of those other guys that are really the only pillars of success for the mild time that this team had it will also be a good way. You know, put Kevin Garnett, give him a clicker and put him in that theater they have and let him just show some tape of what it was like in Target Center in 2004 and how crazy that place was. This is, this is the time I punched Francisco Elson in the nards <laughs> in game two, yes. And then Rudy Obeck, <laughs> this is the time I punched Kyle. So, yeah, just having <laughs> having that history, I'm with you. I, it, it'll be good for this franchise to embrace some of that. And, you know, the 35th anniversary and wearing these throwback jerseys 21 times, significant number, uh, I think is their step in the right direction. But it'll all come back to, you know, can you win – I think the Vegas number is 47 and a half, but can you win 48 games? Can you get close to 50? That's the first step in this linear process moving forward. Yeah, I got the over, by the way, of course. Always bet the over. <laughs> on the uh, would you like me to start at 101 and work my way down to 200 or 200 and work my way up to 101? Start for this. I'd prefer you start at 101 because there's no way by 170 these are real people. Like Leonard Miller is probably 125 and he hasn't played yet. I'm just going to peek here and see. Okay, I'm not going to peek too much. I want to. I want to unveil this and and see. It I can't as you name see 200 it. Timberwolves players, and this is my favorite team. You know what though? I mean, life. I'm I'm looking at the next 25, and these are definitely like if you're a diehard Wolves fan, okay. mostly household names. So, okay. this is uh, from listener Isaiah Potts. This is we that. already did our top 100 Timberwolves. You can find that podcast from a couple months ago on the Flagrant House podcast feed. Click the like button and the subscribe button on the Score North YouTube channel. And a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify to help us grow this Timberwolves lifestyle community. 
So uh, Isaiah Potts, take it away here. 101, crunch. <laughs> That's okay. right. He's got Keep the mascot going. 101. Okay. 102. I'm going to go. I'll just, I'm not going to say all the numbers. I'll just take you to 110. We can react. Uh, Michael Oloa Candy, Danielle Marshall, Brandon Roy, Andre Miller, Tayshawn Prince, Nikhil Alexander Walker, Chris Dunn, Rod Strickland, and Chase Budinger. Who, by the way, I saw Chase Budinger on like ESPN The Ocho playing in some beach volleyball thing. A He's couple crazy weeks good. Like he was a good basketball player coming out of Arizona, and then he had his a stint in the league. He's like a dynamite volleyball player. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, Andre Miller. I think you said that. I mean, Tayshawn Prince was also. I was pretty excited. Tayshawn Prince was when the late great Flip Saunders was managing the team, and basically with all the youth they had and dunks after dark and Levine and Wiggins and Cat, he like brought in a veteran for each position group i think it was andre yeah. miller in the guards tayshawn in the forwards and then kg with the centers or the big men so that was i, I like that because that was like a business 101 of like let's bring in some old consultant who can yeah. mentor the the youth <laughs> but uh no those, those are pretty good names did you say rod strickland uh i Is said that, uh let's see here was that did i make that name up i'm like rod strickland yeah rod strickland the old Timberwolves. blazers the old blazers guard right oh he had a I, cup, a cup of coffee here Okay, yeah, he wore number one. Uh, all right, like yeah, 90, he was, I, like two thousand. Yeah, I think it was 2001. like two thousand. So okay, that's a pretty good one to one ten. Okay, one eleven. Jalen Noel, <laughs> Alexi Shved is one twelve. Lance Stevenson was here for like a couple ten day contracts, right? Sean Rooks, Anthony Carter, the basketball player, Jordan McLaughlin, Roni Turioff, Josh Howard, Wes Johnson, and Anthony Randolph bring us to one twenty. Okay, the West Johnson one hurts. That he's that low. That's Number a four tough overall pick, right? That's a tough hang. Um, one of the picks, I just coming out of Syracuse, I hate that school because they've just given the Wolves so many lemons in the draft. But uh, that one is the biggest. Ronnie Turioff was really cool. I, he was in that undersized power forward energy guy off the bench that the Wolves have had more than anyone. But uh, yeah. Ooh, okay, West Johnson. Okay, 121, Luca Garza. 122 Kendall Gill. Ooh, great, okay. great yep. like good sort name. of like eighth guy off the bench in his day. Felipe Lopez, Tom Hammonds, Irvin Johnson, not like Magic Johnson, yeah, the Les other Magical. Irvin Johnson with six knee braces. Uh James Johnson, Indy EB, Todd Day. That's way too high for Indy EB, by the way. Theo Ratliff's contract and <laughs> Thurl Bailey. Uh, I have Thurl nothing. Bailey was a good jazz player in the 80s, right? And then yep, he came over, yep. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I have nothing bad to say about James Johnson. Uh, great person, uh, triple black belt, uh, frightening human being to talk to. So, yeah, and, and EB, you could do, if someone wants to do the 201 through 300 list, EB shouldn't even be in that. Like, he should not even qualify. War, maybe the worst Timberwolves player of all time. Yeah, I think he got in against the Spurs one game, if I remember correctly, and... Uh like scored a basket at the end of his second year. <laughs> yeah, Thurl Bailey, he was like a 20 he was like a 20 and uh yeah, you know, I was like a 20 and 10 guy with the Jazz. Like a 20 and 7 guy for a couple of years with the Jazz. And he came here in the twilight of his career. Uh okay, Luke Mba Mute 131, oh. Luol Deng 132, and then Lauren Woods, Oliver Miller, Robbie Hummel, Quincy Lewis, Kevin Ali, Gary Neal, Ryan Hollins, and Stanley Roberts. Gary Neal, that's a name drop. Wow. Ryan Hollins played way too many minutes, but was a serviceable center. Um, God, this is a really depressing list. Do any of those names stand out to you? All of them stand out to me in some way. Uh, there's some some big men in the KG era here, like Lauren Woods, Oliver Miller, and Stanley Roberts. They just they tried so many other big men when KG was here that in almost any section of like 10 players on this list, you're going to find two of them. And then uh, Quincy Lewis... U of yep. M legend, had yep. a nice little career in the NBA, uh, a friend of mine. 141, Glenn Robinson the third, Sheldon Williams, 142, Ramon Sessions, Austin Rivers, Keith McLeod. Uh, is it Keita Bates Jop, right? Kate, yep, Keita Bates Jop still in the league, now plays for the Suns, actually. Adrian Payne, Sam Jacobson, Ooh. another former gopher, Juancho Hernan Gomez, and Robert Pack bring us to 150. This is 
this now that you get into this part of the list, this is very similar to when you're at therapy, like six weeks in, you start really digging into stuff of like why you don't sleep at night anymore. Yeah. Cause like, oh, cause that <laughs> happened when you were 18. It's like, yeah, I watched Ramon Sessions. Oh, I, I thought Ramon Sessions was like the point guard of the future. Uh, so but, the but first, it is it, first it's, round pick for Adrian Payne. Oh, it, and the, the one real serious trend that comes through this list, even more than the list you made, was that this franchise has been so unsuccessful for so many years that they were a stopgap for like, well, we don't have a lot of talent. Maybe we can go get that guy who used to be good or whatever. And yeah. thinking that they would like, re- I mean, really like the Nikhil Alexander Walker thing, but the inverse, they went and found this guy that was maybe untapped potential and brought him in. They've developed him. They would go get these guys that were like, oh, you were good over there. Maybe you'll be good here. And then it was like Mike Miller's like, I'm just not going to shoot threes. It's like, yeah. oh, cool. All right. Why, why am I here? Okay, 151, Derek Martin, Trevion Graham, Randy <sighs> Brewer. It's an old school big name there. Cole Aldrich, Lazar Hayward, Jarrett Culver, Howard Isley, Shabazz Napier, Bob McCann, and Will Avery. Will Avery, I think, was a, wasn't he a first round pick out of Duke during the KG yep. era? Yep. Pretty sure. Cole Aldrich okay. uh, was on the books, the financial books, up until like two years ago. So yeah. shout out to him. He should just be higher just because he was still cashing checks and like was the, literally cashing checks at a moment that I was covering the team where I tweeted out like the Wolves should just put Cole Aldrich in. And he like tweeted at me like, I'm watching the game from the couch. <laughs> and I just cashed a $400,000 check on that's, Friday. So that's great. He's got the, the, uh, the Bobby Bonilla plan, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, 161, Kirk Snyder, 162, Reggie Jordan, 163, Aaron Brooks, Jared Bayless, Brad Miller, Costa Kufos, Greg Monroe, Sidney Lowe, the player version, not the coach version, Josh Minot, and Nate Knight round us out to 170 here. And if you're still listening to this podcast, (laughs) wow, wow. Send us your Venmo. We owe you money. Uh, (laughs) Greg Monroe just needs to be higher. That's my biggest take so far. He came in that one day, landed on the plane at like 420, got in an Uber, got to the stadium. They gave him a jersey, number 57. He came in, helped them win the game forever and lower. The Moose, Greg Monroe. You know, one time, because uh, he played for the Bucks for a little bit, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. right? So I have some family in Milwaukee, and I remember we went to like some new trendy brunch spot in like the third ward, and uh, we're sitting at our table, and I'm looking over to the front of the restaurant, and there's just a giant seven foot human being patiently waiting for a table, and it was Greg Monroe, just great, great guy by all accounts too. I think he was on a ten day, but uh, the team like you know he's on a ten day, so he's here for ten days or whatever. Some of the teammates that are still here were like, it was cool to have that guy around. Like he was a great. Locker room presence was really helpful, like in pregame workouts and stuff, teaching guys little post moves. So yeah. I think he might be out of the league now for good, or maybe he's overseas. But I'll never forget the Greg Monroe era. Okay, 171, Troy Daniels, Maurice Evans, Mike Brown, Shane Heal, a great Australian, <laughs> an Australian three-point shooter, I should say. Uh, Ed Davis, Jason Collins, Rodney Carney. Michael Doliak, Mark Jackson with a C, and then Sasha Pavlovich get us to 180. I'll keep going here. Yep. 181, <laughs> Gerald Glass, Malcolm Lee, Bracey Wright. He was a uh, Indiana Hoosier, if I'm not mistaken. Bracey Wright. Damian Wilkins, Cameron Reynolds, Donald Royal, Brandon Rush, Anthony Bennett, a former number one overall pick there. Justin Patton, who was a, for- a first round pick, I think, for Tom Thibodeau. Yep. And then Kelvin Booth. And then here's the last 10 for you. This is great, man. This Here we is go. a great list. Is it uh, Dewan Wheat or Dijuan uh, Wheat? Nah, not going uh. to not not work here anymore. <laughs> Brian Cardinal, Justin Hamilton, Alan Crabb, Jake Lehman, Leandro Balmaro, Pat Durham, Damjan Rudez, Keelan Martin, and Omri Caspi is the 200th best Timberwolf in franchise history. Thank you, Isaiah Potts. You are hereby the third member of this show. I think like 186 was Brandon Rush. That was, I just remember that name because the first ever content I did, I wrote a piece on is Brandon Rush, the key, like the, the best Wolves 3 and D guy in the history of the franchise. And he might have played 20 games and it took me six days to write the blog post and it was terrible. But the fact that Balmero made, a, made uh, the top 200 is insane to me. We need to talk to the committee. Because I don't know if what 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 rank was he? Do you have it on there, Leandro Balmero? Uh, Balmero was. Hold on a second here. 
He was 196. 196. Without checking it, I would bet my life he did not play 196 total minutes for the Timberwolves. I'll which, check. <laughs> which no tells way. you he played like seven minutes in one in like one season, right? Yeah. So um, that's a tough one, but. Uh, I'm glad to see Josh Minot was in there, even though not really getting a stint yet. But I, w- I would very much put Leonard Miller in the top 200. Leonard, if you're listening, uh, you are a top 200 Timberwolf player of all time. Okay, Balmaro played oh, 241 minutes. 241 okay, well, minutes for the Wolves. 260 of those were in Vegas Summer League. He played my 60 minutes with Utah last year. That's okay. what I was thinking. Okay. By the way, if somebody, uh, now that we have the top 200 Timberwolves of all time, if somebody <laughs> wants to give us some honorable mentions that didn't quite crack the 200, send them in and we will read them on the show. Shake we, Milton. We, da- we, we dare someone it. to. <laughs> Dude, Shake Milton. Yeah, he's got it. Sorry, uh, Omri Caspi, but you are now bumped out of the 200 for Shake J- Milton. And Jake Lehman needs to be higher too, not because of anything he did on the basketball court on it, like in the between the lines. But he, there's that viral video where he is walking to the bench pregame, and someone I think asked him towards the end of the season, like, "Hey, Jake, like, how, how many minutes are you going to play tonight?" And he just put a big zero. <laughs> He's like, I, "I know I'm not getting off the bench." So shout out to Jake. So amazing, man! All right, that's a wrap on this episode of Flagrant Howls, Kyle. You can get back to your uh, your laundry hopefully in time for Game Three at Target Field. And uh, prepare for the next Wolves preseason thrashing of, I think, the Knicks are the next opponent. Gerson right? Rosas and the Knicks on Saturday. Revenge game for both sides. Right? <laughs> the Nate Knight revenge game coming up. <laughs> uh, all right, there it is. Flagrant Howls, your favorite Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.